at Disney, Showtime, MTV, CMT, and Fuse. And he's the executive producer of Hangar One. And he's, I consider him at this point now a friend and a colleague, Paul Villadolid. All right, thank you everybody. Um, I want to thank Linda Moulton Howe first. That was an incredible presentation. One of the things that I love about uh, these events and coming to uh, conferences like this is that you get little slices of information and enlightenment when you listen to people like her talk. And I thought she gave us an entire meal, so I really enjoyed that. Uh, I also want to get the big elephant out of the room. Um, I know that Stanton Friedman couldn't make it here, um, and I know that I was kind of named his replacement. I know that I'm no Stanton Friedman. Um, so everybody who's still here and sticking around, I appreciate that. Uh, and it's a good thing for me that we're talking about UFOs in the media because that gives me a chance to talk about Hangar One, and I have a lot to say about that. Um, so before I get into it, I do want to find out how many people here have actually seen Hangar One. That's pretty good. Um, are there some Hangar One fans out here? People who like the show? Great. Anybody here who didn't like the show? I'm open to suggestions and input. If you are, we can talk about that later. Um, anyway, I want to talk to you about this series, which I'm very proud of. Um, it's actually a show that has been uh, many years in the making. Um, the development of the show actually lasted three different regimes of international directors here at MUFON. I started the process about three years ago uh, when Clifford Cliff was director and approached him about making a show. And, you know, I guess they get a lot of people coming to them. And it's hard to tell from their perspective um, who, who these producers are what your agenda is, the question I kept getting asked by everybody, even during the making of the series when we were going after experts was, you know, are you guys into debunking? Are you, you know, are you another skeptical show uh, trying to talk about this phenomenon? And I'm glad that Cliff believed me when I told him that we wanted to do a very different kind of a show. Um, you know, the development process lasted into Dave McDonald, um, who was the first person who really granted me access uh, to move on, took me to the hangar. Um, and then last year when we started producing the show, Jan by then was the director, and he really took us through the hard work of uh, pulling case files, pulling research, pulling information, getting the show on the air. Uh, so I really want to thank all three of you. You've been incredibly supportive. Uh, you've been very, very transparent and willing to open up um, Hangar One, all of your archives, and uh, give us all of that research so we could share it with the audience. Um, there are a couple of people, before I get into this, that I do want to thank, since I have an audience here. Um, I want to acknowledge some people. Um, Bob Wood, I know you're out there in the audience. John Schusler couldn't make it. Um, the two of them have been incredibly valuable in providing guidance. Uh, to our show and making sure that we presented our facts with as much authenticity, accuracy, and truth as possible. Um, Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Ruben Uriarte shared some of their best case files with us last season. I really appreciate that input. <clears throat> uh, Roger Marsh, I know you already won one award from Jan this weekend. Um, but I want to thank you. You've always been generous with your time, with all of your knowledge. Um, there's a new board member here at MUFON I want to acknowledge. It's Tony Cataldo. Um, Tony has an entertainment background. So he understands all of the challenges and nuances of putting a complicated show like this on the air. Um, and he's really been a great addition to the MUFON team. Uh, I don't know who's... Um, in terms of um, our cast, I don't know if uh, Jason McClellan is still in the audience, but 
I do want to acknowledge from MUFON, Jan Harzen, John Ventry, Jeremy Ray, Jason, if you're still here, you guys did an incredible job um, uh, as experts on our series. And a uh, couple more thank yous, I'm almost done. I want to uh, just mention my incredible production partners, Go Go Lucky Productions. They're the ones that I produce the show with. And there is one name in the credits that I do want to acknowledge. His name is Doug Siegel, and he's been um, another executive producer and my partner in getting the show to be what it is. And lastly, I don't know if he wants me to mention him, but hidden out in this crowd is our H2 executive, uh, John Bearhoff, who's been incredibly wise, very supportive, um, and he's really responsible for shepherding this series to the air. So thank you, everybody. <clears throat> All right, enough thank yous. Um, I want to talk about Hangar One. So, um, full disclosure, this is not the first UFO show that I have produced. Um, and I was amazed because last year when I started researching stories for Hangar One, I was on the interwebs and I was on lots of interesting um, UFO pages and I stumbled upon a program that I actually produced uh, back in 1995 and found that it was the subject of quite a lot of conspiracy speculation. Um, so, this is the show. Um, back in 1995, I worked for Disney. And at the time, I was producing all of their television specials and I was asked to produce a TV special to promote a brand new uh, theme park attraction at uh, Walt Disney World called Alien Encounters. So, um, usually Disney specials were parades or they were 30 minute commercials. I really wanted to do something different. So my brilliant idea was to, prom uh, was to basically wrap the promotion inside a documentary about the UFO phenomenon and alien abductions. And from what I learned on these websites, apparently conspiracy theorists believe that this program was actually a veiled government-sponsored attempt by Disney to test the public's readiness for disclosure. And uh, I hate to disappoint everyone here, but uh, Michael Eisner cared about one thing, and that was promoting his theme park. And uh, nobody came to us, nobody planted the seed about making this special. It was really all my idea. And at the end of the day, I felt like I got away with something great by producing this little documentary about this subject uh, that I've always personally been interested in. So now it's 20 years later. Here I am making another UFO show. And uh, you have to ask yourself, I think there's so many shows out there, why do we need another UFO series? Um, you know, I think to me, there are a lot of answers, but one of them I think is obvious because aren't UFOs potentially the greatest mystery of our time? Why wouldn't you want to explore this? Why wouldn't you want to keep exploring this? And I think we really have the public support. Um, the public wants to believe that this is out there. And um, I know that there are surveys that have been done. Huffington Post has been doing this uh, for quite a number of years. And I know that other people here at the conference have referenced these statistics, but a few years ago, back in 2012, 36% of Americans stated that um, they believe that UFOs have, in fact, visited the Earth as have extraterrestrials. Um, last year, that number went up to 48%. Recently, I have read some surveys that say that that number is maybe up to 71% today. Um, but I think that interest has always been there. Fascination has always been there. And, uh, you know, I think that you, it, it's it's always timely to do a show like this. Uh, but there are a couple of other things that were driving us. One is that Hangar One really truly brings a unique perspective uh, to these shows. Uh, there are a lot of UFO shows out there, like I explained. And uh, one of the things that we set out to do from the beginning was take UFOs seriously. Um, we do believe that this is a real phenomenon. Working with MUFON, there's enough evidence uh, inside their case files to support all of this. And we felt that it was time to produce a series where we approached it from the perspective that this phenomenon was real. 
And there are a lot of shows out there that are interested in presenting that uh, evidence, but also at the same time questioning, did this happen, did this not happen? And we weren't interested in making a show that would be debunking legitimate UFO claims. Um, another <clears throat> reason to make the show is obviously MUFON itself. MUFON, as I've come to learn more and more about them, is an incredible organization, and they bring a lot to this television series. Um, one of the most frequent questions that I get from people, especially after watching the first season, is, okay, we loved those uh, eight episodes you produced, um, but is the series over now? I mean, how many more different UFO stories can you tell? Well, I am, you know, one of the things that I love about working with MUFON is that I think that they come to the table with a never-ending source of stories. Um, if you've watched the show, you've heard our line that inside Hangar 1, MUFON has over 70,000 case files. And within that archive, there literally are thousands of unique stories that are waiting to be told. Uh, people here, a couple of people here have asked me why is the show called Hangar 1? And Hangar 1 actually um, is a hangar that um, has housed um, all of MUFON's archives. Hangar 1 is the center of our show. Um, it's really at the center of everything that we want to talk about because it's MUFON's warehouse. Um, this is its home uh, for everything, for all of its 70,000 case files. Um, it also represents over or nearly 50 years of research, studies, academic papers uh, that analyze and dissect this planet's long history of interactions with UFOs, with research from renowned researchers like Leonard Stringfield, Bud Hopkins, Stanton Friedman, uh, many, many more. I first uh, visited MUFON, as I mentioned, a few years ago when I went to Cincinnati. Dave McDonald was director, and uh, we were at uh, this airport somewhere in Cincinnati, and he pointed Hangar 1 to me, and he told me then that inside MUFON's Hangar 1 warehouse, there were enough case files and evidence to blow the lid um, on the truth about UFOs. And I don't think, actually I know now that he wasn't exaggerating. Um, I wasn't allowed in the hangar at that point. I looked at it from a distance and I wanted in. But there's something about this hangar that's unique because it has this perfect wall of security that surrounds it. It sits at an airport on an active runway. No one can access this hangar unless the entire airport is fully shut down, which I think is brilliant. Um, because honestly, it's the perfect security. Nobody can get in there. So we made Hangar One the heart and soul of our show. Again, because it represents the entire history of MUFON's hard work over 50 years, collecting, cataloging, researching, and investigating UFO sighting reports from all around the world. Um, there are statistics here that um, have been repeated over and over again. One is that MUFON has 70,000 case files. Of these 70,000 files, um, they're very, very forthcoming by admitting that most of these 70,000 sightings can be explained away. Uh, but at the end of the day, probably 5% to 7% cannot. So if you take away all the IFOs or identified objects, Planes, satellites, the planet Venus rising, flares, drones, kites, even weather balloons, and then put aside all of the hoaxes that MUFON also uncovers, you have these 5% of cases that remain in this golden unexplained category. But still, even just 5% of cases means that MUFON has approximately 5,000 existing cases in their archives um, that remain unexplained. I want to repeat that. That's over 5,000 unexplained cases. Many of them are incredible. A great number of them are absolutely mind-boggling, and they will turn your head around. These are very, very solid cases where the evidence adds up, 
were their credible witnesses. In addition, no other organization has over 900 UFO investigators spread out not only across all 50 states, but also represented in nearly 40 countries across the globe. So that gives us access to stories and case files uh, that are not just here in the US, but are from all around the world. MUFON's reach and their dedication is incredible. Um, because of this organization, consider this. They receive nearly 1,000 new sighting reports every month, which adds up to 10,000 to 12,000 cases a year. So if you look at the 5% that fall into the unexplained category, that means that every year we're getting probably 800, 700 to 800. This is a typo, it's not 80 to, 80 to 90, it's 700 to 800 new cases every year that remain unexplained. Um, these new cases add new pieces to the UFO puzzle, something that Hangar One is interested in exploring. And clearly there are enough uh, files and new stories to keep bringing this to the public. So when people ask me if we have enough UFO stories to tell, I just smile at them because I know that um, if we're fortunate enough, we can be telling these stories for a long, long time. So, um, I have to say that after being given access uh, to these files and looking at what's in there, that MUFON may be the greatest resource of UFO sightings uh, probably in the world, with one probable exception, which would be our government, but they're not exactly into sharing their information, are they? Um, <clears throat> We are very fortunate to be on, I think, the perfect network for this series, um, History 2. Um, and H2 recognized early on that building a show with MUFON had some very, very unique advantages. They love the fact that our stories come from a real organization and a real location that contains real case files. And I think that that's one of the things that really separates us from other UFO shows out there. Because if you think about it, it's an incredible advantage to align yourself with a show um, and an organization that's been engaged in investigating and reporting on UFO sightings for so long. We also know that uh, MUFON's case files, the ones that we select, uh, the ones we're using in the series, by and large hold up to the scrutiny of both scientific and investigative inquiry. Um, and they come with many credible witnesses. Some of these case files um, that we have are 40 or 60 pages long. And they are investigations that have run the course of two months or four months or six months or even longer. Um, so there really is a lot of depth. They're very, very convincing. And um, you know, I think that when you have that material at your hands, uh, it can be very, very compelling. And we believe that these are stories that deserve to be reported to the public. Um, so, um, <clears throat> and one of the things that we do in the series, I know that there's been some uh, comments from some people, why are you telling the story about Roswell again? Why are you covering Kecksburg? Why are you covering JAL's Flight 1628 or the Chicago O'Hare Airport? They've all been covered over and over again on other UFO shows. But from our perspective, if you're a respectable UFO series, um, I think it would be a real omission to not mention these landmark cases. You have to. But what we can do, which again I think is unique, is we can take those famous cases and then dig into MUFON's case files and find other lesser known or even unknown cases that mirror and illustrate that those famous cases were not isolated, isolated incidents. Um, that the cases that you know about may just be the tip of the iceberg. Okay, I brought a treat here. Um, not everything that we produced for season one uh, ended up in the show. Um, and we had um, a bunch of kind of pulled from the editing floor, floor clips and I just brought one to share with everybody because it provides a nice segue into my next segment. So, I'll play this. Got 
Guys, is the sound working? Here, I'm going to start it over again. Operation Crossroads was responsible for the testing of nuclear bombs in 1946 on Bikini Atoll. Oscar Schneider was a captain in the U.S. Navy. He worked in nuclear medicine and helped design the first nuclear submarine. He said that the reason why they bombed that is because it was an extraterrestrial underwater base. And he said that his photographs showed these craft leaving the very microsecond that that bomb went off. And that's the big controversy because those photos are not clear enough to make that distinction. But it's, it's a possibility. It is a possibility. Kenya Tall was not involved in any essential battles during World War II, but was chosen for its remoteness. The remoteness of this atoll would seem to make it a perfect location for an undersea base to be concealed. How hard might it be to have an underground base under the floor of the Pacific Ocean, somewhere thousands of miles off the US coast? No one's gonna bother you there. If you're deep under the ocean floor near some abandoned atoll in the Pacific, you got total security there. Oscar Schneider's story is never verified, and atomic bomb testing in Bikini Atoll may have destroyed any evidence of his claims. All right. Um, you know, one of the great benefits um, of having so much material to work with is that uh, there's really too many stories to pack into an episode. So we do have, we have a lot of material like that. And um, one of the things we're doing is working with H2 to make some of those available. We've got to figure that out, but I think they'll be available online uh, so that you can see a lot of the extras that we had from last season. Um, I wanted to talk about storytelling. And to me, this is probably um, the center you know, the heart of our show. Um, we're really, really fortunate to have some great experts on the show. And we relied on them to kind of get the emotion and get these stories across. Uh, you know, a lot of that weight was carried by people like John, uh, Jeremy Ray, uh, Dwight Equitz. Um, and it was backed up by some uh, really strong, credible witnesses like Richard Dolan, Michael Schrapp, Leslie Kane. Um, they contributed a lot, these experts, by informing all of our cases and stories with a lot of substance and context. And I think that we worked really hard to try to shift the tone or establish our own tone for how we tell stories in Hangar One. If you look at a lot of UFO shows, and there are a lot of very, very successful UFO shows there, you know, I think we are one in a line, especially on history, of some very successful shows like um, Ancient Aliens and UFO Hunters. Um, you know, they share a lot of these same stories, but I think that a lot of other shows um, have, in an effort to be scientific, to be investigative, and to be thorough, they sometimes end up reporting facts a little analytically. And I think that by doing this, you can lose the emotional impact of a story if at the same time you're always asking, but did this really happen? I'm not sure if it played out like this. Maybe there's another way of looking at it. And Hangar One really wants to remove that objective separation because we want our first person eyewitness accounts to capture the full awe and astonishment of a UFO experience. Um, it's something that we talked about from the beginning and it's really important to us. We want our audiences to feel like they're inside each of these stories, and we want people who've had these experiences to know that we know exactly what they've been through. We pay attention to all the little details. Um, you know, if somebody in a case file describes a UFO as only being two feet in size, we don't have the inclination or desire to make this thing 60 feet because it'll play better, it'll be a bigger story because 
I really believe that there's no need to elaborate any of these stories. They're incredible enough on their own, and you just don't need to do that. If you just listen to what these witnesses reported and experienced, um, that's powerful enough. So we kind of have this dialogue internally on our production team that we want to look at every case file in every episode as a campfire story. These are the stories um, that you tell around a campfire you know, to those that you want to bring inside your circle. And we want Hangar One's stories to feel that way. We want to remember that inside every case file is this amazing experience. And behind that experience is a witness, you know, somebody who is real, who lived through that. So we don't want to forget that point of view. Uh, and we want these stories to be heard as they happen. So we really do our best to capture the full dimension um, of what these witnesses report, uh, remembering that it was probably the most unforgettable and the most incredible thing that ever happened to them. At the same time, we're also not trying to shove information down people's throats and say, this is absolutely what happened, so you have to believe it. Um, you know, it's one of the complications of uh, UFO research um, that, you know, sometimes a lot of people question the evidence, question the details, question uh, the witnesses, and, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to really narrow it down to the stories that hold up to scrutiny and allow our audience to, desire, to decide. Um, in terms of storytelling, that's why our cast has been so important. Um, you know, we have a lot of experts on the show who have lived this UFO investigative experience for a long time, and they're very, very articulate about explaining what happened or why it happened. Uh, but we have also uh, found some experts on our show who are, also, who are able to tell those stories from a real emotional perspective. Again, just trying to bring our audience inside that experience and remembering uh, that these are incredible events that happen to somebody. Um, so, you know, that really brings me to witnesses who are very, very important to this show because we wouldn't have these stories without their contributions, um, without them coming forward. And luckily for us, MUFON is oftentimes the only place that people feel comfortable coming to report a UFO experience, because it's sad but true um, that a real stigma exists for people who report or admit to seeing a UFO. And a lot of speakers this weekend have talked about that. You know, generally you're not going to be treated kindly by the media, so you're opening yourself up to that. Um, even your friends may think that you're nuts. I know that there are a lot of people who have experiences and don't even feel like talking about it with their loved ones. Um, but somehow it wasn't always like this. You know, if you check out these newspaper headlines, back in the 40s and 50s into the 60s, uh, UFO news actually hit the front page. It was almost mainstream. The New York Times reported it on the front page, the LA Times, the Washington Post, um, newspapers all across the country. If there were sightings, the reporters were reporting it. But things changed. Um, you know, I think a lot of that lends itself to some of the conspiracy undertones that you may find on our show. You know, I think that things probably changed around 1953 when uh, Truman um, um, had the Robertson panel um, and they came back and kind of dictated that the UFO phenomenon was getting a little bit out of control with the public and they really wanted to control the uproar and start um, these campaigns of uh, disinformation and suddenly pushing down uh, UFO reports and investigations and pushing it more into the popular culture. Um, you know, so now you have events like Stephen Bassett's um, congressional hearings, which should have been on the front page of every newspaper around the country. Um, and when I read about it, I think it was buried on page 12 of the New York Times. So, you know, the question for us is, how can we change this dialogue so witnesses will no longer worry about coming forward? Because I think it's really important that more and more people who have these experiences do step forward and talk about their sightings. And I think some promising things may be happening. Um, 
possibly Hangar One has a little bit to do with that. Um, you know, again, our show tries to tell these stories um, from a very serious, credible place. We don't want to put um, the witnesses who come forward, we don't want to make them feel that we have this hidden agenda to uh, debunk them or tear apart their stories. Um, a lot of people that we reached out to last season asked them to be on camera, asked us that question over and over and over again. What is your real intent? Um, how are you dealing with my story? Um, are you tr just trying to debunk um, and uh, discredit me and what I experienced? <clears throat> um, I think we're by and large successful about turning that around. Um, during production, I've personally spoken with a number of witnesses um, who filed reports with MUFON, um, you know, and I asked them if they'd be willing to go on camera to tell their stories. Because anybody who is willing to do that, I think it's a very important part of the dialogue. Um, and I know it's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy for me to ask people to do that. But we have had witnesses who've seen the show who are now saying yes. Uh, and they've told me that it's because after watching the show, they know that it's um, a show that will take them seriously. And I think they feel that it's a safe place um, where they can share these experiences because we're not out there to make fun of anybody. We're not passing judgment on them or doubt on their experience. We just want to get the truth out there. Um, and these people want their stories out there too. You know, they've had these incredible experiences. They just want to be believed. They just want to be taken seriously. And maybe there'll be strength in numbers eventually. If more people start talking about this, then maybe others will also start talking about their UFO experiences. Um, if they hear stories from others that are similar to experiences that they've had, then maybe they'll step forward. <clears throat> and I know, um, I've heard from Jan Harzen that this is actually already starting to happen. Um, Earlier this year, after Hangar One started airing, um, Jan told me that new witness reports started coming into MUFON. People were stepping forward with stories. They saw an episode and they said, you know, I've held this in for so long, um, but after seeing this, I just know that I have to come forward. I can't take this to my grave. I have to come forward and share this. Um, and these were reports coming in from commercial air pilots, military pilots, military officers, ordinary people, um, people who saw stories that echoed something that they had experienced. So maybe, maybe Hangar One on one level can convince people to reach out and contact MUFON. Um, you know, if anybody has reports, if anybody had anything happen, you know, not just in the past week, but 10, 20, 30 years ago, uh, you should get that on the record um, because from that we can start to build out more pieces of the puzzle um, and then maybe also reduce some of the stigma and fear that comes with talking openly about UFOs. Another thing about witnesses is that everybody loves credible witnesses. Uh, there's so much value that's placed if you're an astronaut or a, a military officer or a pilot. Um, you know, if you're a cop or a fireman, and you report uh, a UFO sighting, people stand up and listen to you and take you more seriously. But does that really mean that we need to discredit anybody who doesn't have that same background? You know, what if they had the same experience, the same sighting that the cop or the pilot did? Is it any less valid to them? Um, and again, the bottom line is that whoever has these experiences, these stories, stories uh, need to be shared. Um, and so what MUFON is building with this accumulation of data, with the thousand or so new case files that are coming in every month, um, they're creating an enormous database. Again, I think it's probably the largest in the world of UFO sightings. Um, and one of the things that we can do as we start pouring through those case files is to try to understand and not ask, is this happening, is it real? but say, okay, something is happening, so why are they here, and what does this all mean? The beauty of having MUFON's case files and archives at our disposal is that they have a collection of shared experiences from people from all backgrounds, 
across many decades that are reported from locations all around the United States, all around the world. So we can pull case files together and we can make comparisons. We can start connecting the dots. And Hangar One is obsessed with looking for and uncovering patterns. You probably hear that in the show all the time, that patterns are starting to emerge. But these patterns may help to explain, add another little slice of enlightenment to the UFO phenomenon. It may start to reveal some new truths. Um, and that's why our show asks questions like, why are there certain places within this country that appear to be UFO hotspots? Why are there so many triangle UFOs? Why do some people appear to be targets, appear to be chosen for UFO experiences? Um, what's going on in Arizona? Why are there so many UFOs in Arizona all the time? These are all great questions, and again, pieces of this giant puzzle. And these kinds of questions become the starting point um, when we're mapping out a season for Hangar One, when we're looking for episode ideas. We've got this wonderful shared process with MUFON when we're developing uh, episode ideas. I'll go to them and I'll just throw out questions. I'll say, can you give me all of the cases in your files involving cops and UFOs? Can you give me all the cases in your files um, involving pilots and commercial airplanes and UFOs? Can you tell me about trace evidence and phys physical effects cases? Um, can we dig into underwater UFOs? And can you give me everything you have there? And I will literally get dozens and dozens of incredible cases to review for each of these questions. Way too many to fit into a single episode. Um, the depth of these files is truly incredible. And by having so many at hand, we really can start to compare and contrast all these different uh, cases. We can start, start finding commonalities and patterns that maybe start to explain the phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> these shared experiences across different witnesses also make it more difficult to dismiss that these stories are real when so many people seem to be experiencing the same thing. You know, so you have to ask, if so many people report the same kind of event with the same specific details, then isn't something real going on? So for our show, by going through this process, uh, these patterns do start to emerge, and we're able to piece together episodes that are thematically, um, uh, you know, that are thematically organized, and we're able to find answers. We can start to trace these UFO flaps to different regions around the country. We can tie them to different theories and causes. Um, we can start speculating on unique connections uh, that certain populations, like Native Americans, seem to have with UFOs. We can take a dozen men in black cases from the MUFON case files and maybe start to uncover their methods um, and maybe even their agenda. Um, and when you do this, you can start to piece together the whole UFO puzzle and start to speculate on the bigger, more important questions, like who are they? Why are they here? And what does it mean? Those are the questions that we're going to continue to ask through, throughout this series. Um, so I have just one more little treat for everybody. Probably the worst kept secret at the conference this weekend. Um, but for people here who are fans of the show, I'm happy to announce that we are back in production on season two. Uh, I really want to thank H2 for showing that faith in us, um, for, for believing in the show, believing that these stories are important, and allowing us to continue to take them out and share them with everybody. Um, we're producing 12 new one-hour episodes. Um, don't have any air dates. I suggest that you guys just check in to MUFON's website every week, because um, once we do have air dates, they'll be announcing it, so you're not going to want to miss that. Um, I also want to assure everybody that, you know, stylistically, we're proud of the show. Um, so the show essentially is going to remain the same. Um, we are going to probably have even more UFO experts on the series. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we're looking for more people who can help tell these stories because we have more of them and we have more episodes. Um, but the one thing that's going to be different, significantly different, actually, 
Um, you know, last season we covered a lot of better known cases because we were establishing ourselves as a series. This season, we're pulling very liberally from MUFON's case files, and I think that you are going to see a lot of stories that you've never heard of before that you can't see anywhere else. Um, and honestly, they're some of the most incredible stories um, that you can imagine. So at the end of the day, what we all hope um, is that Hangar 1, you know, I think Hangar 1 can hopefully help position MUFON into a really well-earned, well-deserved place, recognized at the center of serious UFO investigative study and research. They have a long, long history uh, to back all of this up. And as Dave McDonald told me a few years ago, I really do believe that they have enough case files and evidence to eventually convince people that this UFO phenomenon is real. Our hope is that Hangar One will always be provocative and entertaining, um, and within our stories, patterns will start to emerge, and hopefully people will start thinking about UFOs in a brand new light. Thank you. <laughs> is there time to take questions? Or is that, do you want to take questions? Oh, yeah, we could take the questions. Yeah? Um, if anybody wants to ask some questions, I'm happy. I'm happy to take some. No, they took it away. All right, I have the first question. The first oh God. Are you going to be back on the show? No, no, no. no. Uh, no. <laughs> when is the box set coming out, the DVD? Uh, That's a great out. idea. You could have sold it here this weekend. I actually don't know. Um, I will, we, we have to uh, talk to our partners at History um, and see when they're planning on doing that. But uh, if there is a lot of enthusiasm for that, that would be a great thing. All right, come on up for your questions and ask it into the mic. Demanding equal time. Demanding people's what? Demanding equal time. Uh, <laughs> honestly, I haven't heard any, uh, any, any response like that. I think that there are so many UFO shows on right now. And um, there are other shows that take um, a little bit more of a skeptical approach. Again, I think our, you know, our show is a little bit different because we're really trying to focus on cases and stories where there has been a lot of research. You know, sometimes we may include a story that is a little more controversial, a little more questionable, but it's part of the whole, um, it's part of the dialogue. And I think that a lot of times it's important to put both sides out there. You know, our show doesn't, you know, we end up asking a lot of questions and we leave a lot of questions on the table because nobody has the final answer about what this is all about and what it means. Our thing is just that, listen, this is happening. These things are appearing. We don't know who they are. We don't know why. Um, but there are a lot of stories out there that need to be heard and need to be taken seriously. I don't know if you can answer this question. Other than files, does Hangar 1 have any artifacts? Um, yes, they do. But I don't think that I can really talk about that. Does Hangar 1 have any artifacts? Other than he wants to know if Hangar 1 has any artifacts. That's a Dan question. That is a Dan, I mean, yeah. The answer is yes, they're testing some right now. Jan says yes, and one is in the process of being tested. And you can't be specific, though. Thank no. Here, here again is that, you know, MUFON is really interested in putting things out. The amount of investigation that they do, the amount of science and study that they put into these cases is incredible. You know, as I mentioned, some of these case files are this thick. And you look and they've been sending things, you know, to labs all across the country, back and forth, and not just to one lab, but to multiple to, to support the evidence that comes back. Real quick, too. Do you have a hard time getting stock footage to use in these shows? <laughs> um, you know, it, we're producing a television show. 
So um, any footage that we have on the show has to be licensed. It yes, has to I be know. accessed. We have to be able to afford it. Um, so if you have free stock footage? No, but I would think, I know about Getty and Image Bank. Yes. I'm familiar with that. Yeah, we're, However, how much actual UFO footage is available in stock footage companies? Uh, um, we've actually been able to um, find um, and acquire, and in some places um, um, use in our show. Actually, MUFON has a pretty incredible archive of photographs. Um, and some video that have come from witnesses. A lot of that stuff has never been seen before. Um, and there are other sources that we've been able to go so there's to. there's no shortage? Then. There is a shortage. Um, you know, I think that, you know, people always ask, why aren't there more photographs? You know, why hasn't anybody captured a UFO? There are actually a lot more photographs and video of UFOs than people realize. Um, but, you know, a lot of times it's difficult to pass the scrutiny. Um, you know. Thank you. Sure. Next. You have to get close. Hi. Um, I'm a um, records manager and a librarian retired. Um, you mentioned about uh, uh, searching for commonalities in the evidence. Okay, so you got 70,000 case files. And I'll bet you a nickel, almost all of them are in paper format. Is that not correct? Um, it's a combination. OK. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of them they, have been scanned. OK, yeah. So that's what I'm getting at. If you take the paper files, scan them, and then, of course, add metadata to that, you can search the metadata for commonalities, and you can search it inside the documents for specific terms. Right. OK? And when you do that, that 70,000 files, boy, you can find a heck of a lot by doing that. that this is my comment. And, and, so you, and so my question is, has that been done to some extent? And is there ongoing work to do scanning of these files? You know, I, I don't. And I do want to tell you, because that's a great question, um, you know, how do we, you know, how do they pull all of the UFO comp cases out of the files? Um, MUFON's an incredible organization. You know, they're primarily a volunteer organization, but there are people who have been working at MUFON for 30, 40, 50 years. There are a handful of uh, individuals in the organization who have an encyclopedic memory. You know, so if I say cop cases, you know, Clifford Clift is one guy who just remembers and knows where to find this stuff. Roger Marsh is another guy who's been incredibly helpful. But also, MUFON CMS system, you can actually punch in keywords and, and dates, and you can find all of the case files relating to a certain kind of craft or a certain date or a certain location. Donations to MUFON help also. <laughs> Hi. I'm hey. wondering how much uh, media, news media attention does the show get, and do you interact with them whatsoever? The news media? Yeah. I don't think we really get any attention. I think it's the same, you know, it's the same discussion that's been going on all this weekend. Um, you know, I think we're viewed as an entertainment show. You know, we try to be very, very entertaining, and through that entertainment, we try to slip in what we think is significant information. You know, somebody over this weekend was talking to me saying, you know, what we really need in the show is to be a purely investigative show. You know, just the facts, the process, you know, just really kind of lock in and show um, why these cases are real. And I told him that, you know, people don't want to be fed medicine. You know, and a lot of times that process is not as exciting. What's exciting and what's entertaining are these accounts and these experiences, and that's what our show is about. And within that, we're able to then kind of validate and provide maybe what it means, validate that this case file went through all this level of investigation, so we believe that these accounts are true. Um, but that's the creative focus of our show. The uh, Pittsburgh Tribune Review ran three articles on the show, but it really was only because a resident 
was in it, so they ran that article in their community. Right. But it's okay, we're still, we've been doing well, even without the media. Yes. Yeah, this is an addendum question of sorts to that stuff I mentioned with the first speaker. I'd like to know to what extent are you willing to refuse to, the, to cooperate with the authorities if they try to censor you? Because as I explained to the first speaker, um, Hangar One airs on the History Channel. History Channel is ultimately owned by Disney, which is a major Illuminati operation, which means that they would try to censor anything that tries to give out too much information or maybe try to put some brainwashing in. And I need to know to what extent are you willing to say, Disney, you're not going to censor us. We're going to show what we want. If you don't like it, you can kick us off the air. And if they kick you off the air, are you willing to try to air your show somewhere else just for the sake of getting this information out to, to the public? Well, that was a mouthful. <laughs> it's, it's a big deal. It needs to be addressed. Okay, I have a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, I couldn't be happier with our partnership with History. They've been an excellent partner, and they have been seeking the truth as much as we are. One of the questions that we always get when we present them these case files and stories is, oh my God, is this document real? Did this event really happen? Is this person that you mentioned a real person? And when we say yes, 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 they're like, okay, go. This is excellent. You know, we haven't had any censoring, any questioning. Um, the other thing is that I worked at Disney for seven years. I was a Disney employee. And um, I don't know, they allowed me to make that UFO show. Nobody, I didn't get notes ever from anybody internally at Disney. That cut that ended up on the air was our cut. There was no control. There was no... You know, that level of sinister control, I just never saw it. But well, you were compartmentalized. You I was what? Compartmentalized. There's so much compartmentalization going on. Even the people at the higher echelons of the ladder of authority don't know what's going on in the ladder above them. And that's especially true with Disney. Everybody thinks, oh, it's a lovely organization. No, no, you go way up. There's so much Satanism and everything else that, that <laughs> people lower on the ladder don't Listen, know Listen, when I was at Disney, I, I had my issues with Disney, too. I left there eventually, but I, I don't know about all that. Uh, first of all, congratulations. The, uh, the quality of the production is great. Thank you. And the whole thing. The, my question is, any requests, any plans to do it in Spanish? Uh, you know, I, I believe that the History Channel um, does have plans to broadcast the show internationally. And when the show is broadcast internationally, it's, it's dubbed over into the local languages. Whether it's available in Spain, I'm not sure. I've heard this weekend that it's been airing in India. So I imagine it's probably been translated. So it's been dubbed. What's that? It's been dubbed. It would be dubbed. Okay. But you know, um, you know, I can't really speak to that. Because there's a lot of interest in South America. Yeah. Well, we're hoping that this show gets all over the world. Thank you. It's seen all over the world. All right. Last question. Um, just want to make a comment. I know a lot of us are seasoned ufologists. We've been around a long time doing a lot of study and investigation. And there are some really diehard people that have studied things to the nth degree. What I saw was part of the criticisms I keep seeing on TV shows are like when you show a case, like maybe the Cash Landrum case or something like that in 1980, we inject additional information into it that's incorrect. And so now what you have is a, a reaction on the part of a lot of the seasoned people saying, well, wait a minute, now you've added sparks to the bottom of the object. So part of the, the thing is when you talk about wanting to make sure that you get the story of out is that we need to really focus on, on getting accurate information and also portraying it accurately. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that we're going to have a balance with that and make sure that we are presenting it accurately so we don't add to it. I yeah. just want to say that the witness for example, also get very upset by watching a show that has added additional things that are not true. Yeah, you know, so. it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a challenge. Um, I have to tell you that, you know, if you work in Los Angeles and you're producing television shows, that the initial instinct of most people is to elaborate and to make it better. And it happens all along the line, from your writers to your director when you're shooting things, to your graphic artists when they're trying to recreate an event. You know, everybody wants to add their little touch to it. For sure. And, you know, that's one of the things that I've tried to focus on is to try to rein people back. And again, say, we don't have to make this stuff up. We don't have to elaborate because the truth is as fascinating as it gets. Um, but that said, you know, in every television show, there are a million moving parts. 
some things aren't going to slip through. I know that some things slipped through last season, and I'm not happy about it. Um, and I do want to just, since you brought that up, Rich, um, you know, I know that one of the things that happened after last season is that, you know, if the production messed up and, you know, spelled Kecksburg wrong um, or placed uh, Cheyenne Mountain in uh, Wyoming instead of Colorado, that MUFON got a lot of email and a lot of notes, um, you know, really lambasting them for the inaccuracies. And that's really unfair because that's not MUFON, that's us, that's the production. And you know, that's our researchers, that's our producers. Um, and every once in a while, a show, you know, things like that slip through, you're gonna make mistakes, nothing is perfect. You know, even feature films, there's continuity errors that people love to throw out on YouTube. Um, but we are doing our best and we do have an open dialogue with MUFON. Um, you know, if they see things that aren't right, or are not accurate, they come to us and we adjust it. And we're going to just keep trying to do this as accurately as we can. But um, yeah, you guys should cut, move on a break. <laughs> if you think that uh, there are things in the show because it's really, it's a production issue. Okay. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks.